Listening to atheists can sometimes be helpful for learning how to be a Christian. I know that might sound totally random and surprising to hear, but just hear me out for one second. Take, for example, the famous British atheist, Christopher Hitchens. Some of you have probably heard about him or maybe read one of his books. Hitchens once remarked that the Christian belief in the God of love amounts to little more than white noise, a little bit of propaganda meant to deceive people into actually believing that religion is benign, harmless. Now, we might argue with Hitchens and just say something like he doesn't really know what he's talking about, he doesn't know anything about Christianity or the scriptures, and then be on our merry way. We could dismiss him, sure, but let's look at what he's actually saying. He isn't actually saying anything about God, first of all. Hitchens is an atheist. What he's actually doing is pointing to all of us and saying, you say that God is love, but I don't really see the proof. And with this, Hitchens would be connecting two things, the love of God and the love of neighbor in a way that isn't totally removed from how Jesus himself does. Just like last week, today in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is being questioned this time now by a Pharisee, one of the representatives of the Jewish authorities from Jerusalem. So a Pharisee, an expert of the law, asked Jesus this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? This is the typical question. This is a typical question one would expect to hear from a teacher of Israel. He's asking Jesus, in the way one would ask any teacher of the law, which law would you say is the most important one, the one, if done well, would kind of help the requirements of all the other laws fall into place, help them get done a little bit more easily? What's the summary? And Jesus answers him by saying something that the Pharisee would actually have already known, already heard. He quotes from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this, he says, is the first and greatest commandment. Again, something that Pharisee would have totally agreed with. But then Jesus goes on to add a second one, because as Jesus insists, the second is like the first. It is like the first in matters of importance, This time, quoting from Leviticus, Jesus says to him, love your neighbor as yourself, adding all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, Jesus isn't saying that he's instituting a new religion that's all about love in opposition to or replacing this other religion that's all about law. Indeed, Jesus' response to the Pharisee urges quotations from the law and the prophets itself, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and the prophet here being the psalm. No, as Jesus says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, the love of God and the love of neighbor, like a door hangs on its hinges, like Jesus hangs on the cross. So the command to love God, then, is a command that presumes a lot. Again, this idea of God loving us is often celebrated, rightly, but it isn't always explored. So love can get reduced to this kind of worldly accommodation to what really amounts to self-love, hence critiques of Christians by people like uh, Christopher Hitchens. The command to love God and neighbor is a command that presumes to know what God's love is like since he is love itself. And that love is no vague generality, but is manifested in God's concrete acts of care for his people, beginning in the First Testament. We can know what it means to love God only because of God's love for us through the law and the prophets. Indeed, this staggering claim is the distinguishing claim of the Christian faith. It is what God's covenant with Abraham anticipates and is In its essence, God's love. Jesus quotes a command from Leviticus, a command to love one's neighbor, which isn't about mere affection, you know? 
kind of enjoying the guy next door, going to their parties or whatever. There in Leviticus, we are told a whole host of practical moral habits about not taking vengeance or playing terrible tricks on the deaf, dealing falsely in law or in business, doing things in God's name that aren't really from God, and so on. So loving someone means what? In general, it means seeking someone else's good. Now, while the Levitical command to love one's neighbor was more or less limited to one's fellow Israelites, Jesus extends that commandment to explicitly include love for one's enemy in Matthew 5, 43. The love of God means seeking the good then, not for those. It means seeking the good for those who are actually a threat to you. You're called to actually seek to preserve their life. To love our neighbor as ourselves does not mean that we get to decide then what love means. Rather, to love well depends on lives that are ordered unto the law. Law which Jesus himself doesn't forego, but who com- whose command he radicalizes and then goes on to fulfill himself. Jesus isn't interpreting the command differently so much as the command is interpreted in light of himself the one fulfiller of the law. And in the form of his going out to seek our good, to save our life, his former enemies. Because of this, Jesus can read the love command in this way, which includes the renunciation of the use of force, the requirement to pick up one's cross. Because this is just what his work of salvation, of love, looks like, what it includes. Love that extends beyond love of self. Love that extends beyond mere peer group. A love that extends all the way to the end. All because love himself, God, is just this sacrifice. If we are going to love as Christ commands, then we have to learn what it means for God to be love, which means that we have to look to Christ, Christ on the cross. And so because love is so demanding and being just like that, the cross, it is no wonder that Christians have so often accommodated to the world which at best replaces love with a kind of, you know, far away tolerance. You do what you like and I'll do what I like. No offense to Yukon Cornelius. Points if you know who that is. To claim to love God without entering the demanding task of loving those we encounter every day is then to simply engage in a kind of self-deception, a fantasy. As the first letter of John says, those who say I love God and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. I might think it is easier to love God, you know, who I see as kind and lovable, than I find it easy to love my annoying neighbor especially the enemy that threatens me and makes demands on my life. But that may be because the God I claim to love is not the grimy, annoying God of love that died on the cross for me. On the cross, we see Jesus, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. We see the nail in his left hand, his loving obedience to the Father. We see the nail in Jesus' right hand, his stooping down to wash our feet. And at the nail in Jesus' feet, we see ourselves gathered, his enemies overcome and forgiven. So it is God's love that puts right all human loves, including the love of self, by showing us what it is and by wrapping us in the transforming power of his forgiveness. 
The point is that whether we start with God's forgiveness for us or our forgiveness of others, both of them are so linked that we can't fulfill one without the other. That's where Jesus is going. So to say that we intend, though, to be loving ourselves, it's important that we see what we're talking about. What we're talking about, what we have to reckon with, is that we int- what we actually intend when we say that we are loving, when we want to be loving people, is that we are actually claiming to want to be, to intend to be like God himself, who is love. Now, because God is love, the amazing principal Christian claim about God that we all know, because God is love, that means then that the world is this moral place that we know. It's just because we believe that this love is so central, so defining of the Christian faith, that is why our faith is so rigorously moral, actually. God's love makes claims on us, even while that love seems, absolute, seems to absolutely undermine what justice seems to demand. But that's the cross, isn't it? That's love incarnate. That is the proof that God is love. The cross and it is where Jesus invites us to look, to see what love is in its fullness. So when looking for love, you may be driven not just to your neighbor, someone who you like and are like, but you may be driven to the service of your enemy. But maybe that person the Lord leads you to is actually yourself, who you struggle desperately to love as God loves. Or maybe that person is someone else, the parent that failed you, the betraying friend or spouse, the one committed to voting for the wrong party or whatever. Either way, because Christ has come in love, so too are we driven obediently so often where we do not wish to go. But of course, we cannot go there on our, on our own power Only Christ can go. Only Christ can get us there. We cannot nurture our own darkness. We will not go and serve our enemies. But in receiving Christ, having him come to live in us, to dwell in us, love itself, Christ does then go again and again, not just seven times, but 77 times in love. Indeed, a light has shone in the darkness of the human heart, in the darkness of the world. And that is where Christ sends us out as lights. So friends, let us receive him, Jesus the Christ, who has so loved us, loved us unto life anew. Amen.